Hello, boys and girls. This is Wrestling Rock on Tour RJ City, and you are listening to the Kings of the Ring. If you like it, great. And if not, well, I didn't really have that much to do with it. You are listening to the Kings of the Ring Podcast Network. Welcome to the Kings of the Ring, fictionalized and romanticized retelling of the 1980s wrestling wars, following the rise and fall of the power brokers of the sport, while offering a peek into the sex, drugs, and muscles lifestyle of the 80s wrestler and the sacrifices they make for success. Today's extra scene will be the listing of the matches for the Alliance Super Bowl of Wrestling Card. If you don't hear this, it's because you're listening to the wide release version of Kings of the Ring. To hear the extended version of the show, simply sign up to be a patron. Patrons hear the extended editions of each episode for season three and four, get the newest episodes a full two weeks before normal people do, access the Breaking Kayfabe, the exclusive podcast series that explains the inspirations for many of the Easter egg references and inspirations for the storylines in Kings of the Ring, plus we name a character after you, Deshaun Brown. That's the name of one of our patrons, and that character is named after him. You get all these benefits, plus supporting the most unique podcast in all of wrestling and audio drama at patreon.com slash kingsotr. Kings of the Ring is intended for mature audiences. Today's episode would be rated M.A. for the usual. Sexual dialogue, profanity, drug use, and smoking. Hear that, kids? Smoking ain't cool anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kings of the Ring. In Madison Square Garden, 16,000 fans watch Thor Hansen defeat Kong the Destroyer, and the fan celebration begins. In the back, a somber Jack Trades walks in, where he is met by EWF interviewer Gary King. Gary King here, I'm with veteran manager extraordinaire, handsome Jack Trades. I gotta tell you, Jack, Thor Hansen has beaten Kong the Destroyer in the middle of the ring one more time. Like every other guy you put in front of him. Thor's been the world heavyweight champion for over a year and a half. So my question is simple. When are you going to give up already? Handsome Jack trades in his trademark bright multicolored jacket with a giant jack of hearts on the back, along with a purposely bad toupee to get heat from the fans, gives the EWF announcer a dirty look. You know something, Gary? That's a question I ask myself every day. When I look in my gold-plated mirror, when are you going to stop trying to destroy Thor Hansen? When are you going to give Thor a break? And you know what that answer is? No, I don't. Never. I will never stop until Thor Hansen is but a memory, until he is a smear on the sidewalk. The All-American Viking represents everything I hate, and I won't rest until he is squashed like a bug. You ever squish a large beetle? Its green guts squirt out and burst. That's what I'm going to do to Thor Hansen. How are you going to do it? (laughs) How else? With an ace up my sleeve. What? I am the greatest manager in the world. And I make a lot of money. It's time I put it to good use. Wait, what does that mean? You'll find out when Thor finds out. (laughs) Kings of the Ring, episode 36. Old Dogs. In the convention center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Crusher Krawchick sits down in a chair, lacing up his old wrestling boots where he's spotted by pretty boy Willie Dean. Hey, Crusher. Good to see you, brother. Packing all sound? Crusher looks up and gives Willie a soft handshake. Just working a couple dates for Bert before I head out to Puerto Rico for a few weeks. Willie pauses for a moment. Last he knew, Crusher was winding down his career. He, uh, heard through the grapevine that ABC News asshole took your house. I had to declare bankruptcy because of the lawsuit. Some real estate hotshot got my house on auction, looking to fix it up and sell it for twice the price. Shit, man. These fucking yuppies, eh? 
and it's turning out to be more trouble than it's worth for him. And I'm trying to buy it back. Well, hope you can. I miss those barbecues you and your wife would put on for the boys. Willie lights up a cigarette. Crusher motions with his eyes as he puts a cigarette in his mouth, and Willie lights him up too. This whole deal. It ain't right what happened to you, brother. You did the right thing smacking that whip. Defending the business. As Crusher thinks about the weight of Willie's words, if he did the right thing, All South's booker, Peyton Thomas, approaches. Hey, Willie, you looking for some extra dough? Want some color tonight? I'll bleed like a stuck pig if you want. Yeah, nothing like that. Uh, got kind of a, a weird deal here. It's a, a job outside of All South. Sure, where is it? It's in Dallas, but it's a... Uh, some outlaw show? <laughs> Don't think the Alliance like you booking us for shit like that. No, no, it's not an outlaw show. It, it's not really a show at all. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's it's just one match uh, without fans. A match without fans? Is this some rich guy jerking off? I ain't wrestling in front of some pervert. But, uh, how much does it pay? It ain't that kind of deal. You're gonna be wrestling in front of an orchestra. Well, he pauses as he tries to picture this. I knew it. It's some rich guy jerking off. Listen, no one's fucking jerking off. It's like a, an artistic thing. Now why the fuck would some guy want you wrestling with no fans, with some creepy classical music playing, unless you're going to be beating your meat to it? I don't know, Willie. We got approached by this conductor guy with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. He's one of them out there artiste types. He's got some kind of vision, but he wanted to see a couple grapplers going at it. Then he plays music with it. Oh yeah, he's definitely yanking his crank. Enough of that. You want to do this or not? What's the payoff? Thousand. Thousand bucks. Why didn't you say so? Fuck yeah, I'll do it. But I ain't gonna feel good about it if this is some kind of a sexual thing. Not saying I won't do it, but I ain't gonna feel good about it. <laughs> Don't worry, Willie. Your principles will remain intact. Who am I working? Uh, who's going over? I don't know, uh... I was going to ask Luscious Ronnie. He'll do anything for a book. Just somebody you can have a passable match with, I Peyton. guess. Crusher Crotchick stands up between Peyton and Willie. I'll do it. What? Come on, Crusher. You're a seven-time world champion. One of the all-time greats. This gig is more for someone uh, desperate and pathetic. You know I'm still standing here, right, Peyton? I got nothing left to prove in my career. A gig's a gig. Peyton taken aback but immediately he senses something is amiss with Crusher Crotchek. Uh, yeah, Crusher, you got it. You said a grand. Yeah, you and Willie will get you all set up. At Spago, the trendy restaurant where all the big deals get made in Hollywood, Jimmy Buck is with the producers of a new movie called Running Scared, as he's up for the lead part, opposite Gregory Hines. This is his big chance to get back into the movies and his last chance to impress. Put me in the hospital and you just wait to see the kind of revenge I have planned for Jesse James on the Eddie Car Show. You're going to be on the Eddie Car Show with that wrestler guy, Jesse James. Impressive. Yeah, the wrestling thing is, uh, how do I put this? We like you, Jimmy. Uh, We've seen the real Marty put together. Uh, funny stuff with the girls and the Jesse James guy. The, the whole thing. It's like crazy out there stuff, uh, manipulating audiences and whatnot, but, uh, eh. What Murray's trying to say is that we really don't have a firm understanding of where your head is at. Jimmy, people talk you now, and nobody knows. Is this performance art? Is this real? You gotta help us understand, Jimmy. We can't afford any wild cards on set. So tell us now, this is all stick, right? Jimmy puts his finger on the side of his nose and winks. Sure it is. They look at him perplexed and even more unsure. Morty, who's chomped more of his fingernails than his cob salad, nervously puffs away at yet another cigarette. Jimmy is just joking. It's, it's all an act. Maybe it was at first, maybe, but you know, things uh, get out of hand. Tempers flare, right boys? Jimmy looks at the man like he's sharing a secret, while Morty buries his face in his hand. Morty screeches his BMW down Wilshire Boulevard away from Spago as Jimmy Buck is confused. Hey, Vey, what the fuck was that? What were you thinking? Are you nuts or something? 
What are you talking about, Morty? Those guys are in the palm of my hand! They love it! They love me! Morty takes one last drag of a cigarette and flicks it into the street, shaking his head, while Jimmy looks out at sunny Hollywood and smiles. At the Minneapolis airport, Charlie Gotch is drinking Chivas Regals on the rocks at the bar waiting for the flight to Milwaukee. An already tipsy Nelly Gotch leaves his table where Brad Milken was and approaches his father, beer in hand. Well, Dad, you gonna say it? Say what? I was right. <laughs> Wipe that smug look off your face. I told you this would happen. Shark and Buzzsaw are over. It's a changing of the guard. My guys are the future. Why don't you just go fuck off? Charlie turns away from his son. St. Paul proved it, Pop. You played your hand and lost. And for the sake of the future of American Midwest wrestling, you know what you have to do. I don't have to do anything but order another sketch. Barkeep. Dad, it's time to go all the way with this and turn the apocalypse babyface. Never. It's not how I want my baby faces to look or to act. Aw, oh, come on. It's 1985. Times have changed. The bartender puts down another chivas, and Charlie puts it to his lips. Crowd in St. Paul is a history of bizarre behavior. That's all it was. Bullshit. And you know it. For years, the fans let us define what was tough. And for the longest, it was guys like Crusher Krawcheck, Dan Sanders, Charlie Gotch. Watch it. Then guys came in like Shark and Buzzsaw, who weren't barrel-chested brawlers, but living superheroes. I mean, those two guys live in the gym and are more muscular every time I see them. Fans take one look at the apocalypse, looking like freaks, and they just can't buy the idea that some old fart could kick their asses. Yeah, when they won't sell. It's not about how they sell. It's about the fans. Turn him babyface, and let's sell some tickets. They're not ready. Neither are the fans. You're really going to make me say it, aren't you? Say what? Thor Hansen. Nelly takes a giant gulp from his beer. How dare you? You had Thor. You refused to recognize that Thor was something new, and he left. Jimmy can't stole him. With cash. No, Dad. He left because of you. Because he knew he was going nowhere with AMW. Christ, you handed Julian Kane a nuclear weapon with that move. This whole wrestling war might be your fault for that alone. Charlie slams his drink, stewing. And if you don't wake up and smell the coffee, Shark and Buzz are going to do the same thing. Next thing you know, you're going to see one of those Empire Wrestling dolls of the apocalypse. Don't make the same mistake, Dad. Nelly finishes his beer and walks off. Shrimp and buzz with. <laughs> Bag heap. Another shivers. Bad, bad Leroy Brown steps into the Empire Wrestling Federation dressing room for the first time in months. Shaking hands and giving fives, all his friends happy to see him and him happy to be here. When he approaches Buddy Melrose, standing next to the format sheet, Leroy Brown, good to see you again. What are you doing here? I thought you had to get surgery on that knee. No, nah, man, no surgery. I just took time off and it healed up on its own. Like I never left. Really? It sounded like it was really messed up. Is that Leroy Brown? Les Henderson walks over with a big hearty handshake for Leroy. How you doing, Leroy? How's the knee? I'm ready to work and ready to go. Good for you, brother. I'll let Julian know. Or, or do you want to give him the good news yourself? Uh, that's okay. You can do it. Uh, but just let him know I came back early, like I said, and I'm ready to kick some ass for him. Sure thing, Leroy. Hey, buddy, see if you can find my match tonight, and we'll make sure to get you back on the booking sheets, too. Thanks, guys. Leroy puts his suitcase down and takes his sweater off, revealing a huge gut. Chief Thunder walks behind Caesar. <laughs> Whoa, brother. You on that new cheeseburger diet? Come on, man. It's part of the healing. Can't really hit the gym like I used to with my knee. I thought you said it healed up on its own. Buddy raises an eyebrow. Oh, you know, it, it, it's healed, but uh, come on, buddy. I'm just doing what I got to do. Uh, I got kids and an old lady. If I don't work, then they don't eat. I understand, Leroy. Just uh, take it easy out there. 
Buddy pats his shoulder as he walks away, concerned. As the 747 pierces the late night sky above Wisconsin, most of the American Midwest wrestlers and other passengers are asleep. The massively muscular Justin Taylor and Jim Vandehei, better known as Buzzsaw and Shark, sit back in their tight Gold's Gym tank tops and bandanas on their heads to cover their mohawk haircuts, both enjoying life, living their dreams, to travel as real pro wrestlers in the best year of their lives. But both are exhausted and trying to catch some shut eye. Hey, wake up. Uh, what the hell? Oh, oh, Mr. Gotch. The 295 pound tank, Justin, looks up and sees a drunken Charlie Gotch standing over him in the aisle, swaying back and forth. Get up, shrimp. No, I, I'm Buzzsaw. What's going on? Are we crashing? Get out of here, sis. Come and take me out. Huh? I haven't mixed it up with the boys in a long time. <laughs> Is this a rib, sir? Oh, you some kind of wimp or something? Charlie slaps Buzzsaw. He's in shock, while Shark's eyes are saucers, anxiously waiting to see what his tag team partner will do. Some of the other wrestlers and passengers start to stir, noticing what's happening. Come on, Buzzsaw. Get up. Do it. Shark eggs him on. Hundred bucks says you can't take me down, Buzzwhip. No way, sir. You're my boss. I'm not gonna do Get it. Get up, you fucking pussy. He's challenging you. Be a man. Listen to shrimp. Well, Mr. Gotch, you're like 70 years old. I don't want to hurt you. Heh, <laughs> hurt me? I wrestled in the fucking Olympics, you dime store pansy. <laughs> now take me down. Two hundred dollars. Get the fuck up, Buzzsaw, and do it. Shark pushes him up. Knock it off, Shark. I don't want to get fired. What's the matter? Afraid you'll get rug burn on your vagina? <laughs> <laughs> Buzzsaw reluctantly gets up and can smell the fresh booze on Charlie's breath, knowing this ends up bad no matter what. Charlie grabs him by the neck and Buzzsaw leans down, trying not to put up a fight. Charlie starts moving Buzzsaw around as a couple of flight attendants curiously watch from the galley. Come on, Nancy boy. Do something. Buzz doesn't push back much, but he won't go down on the floor. Quit being a chicken. Fight him. Eh? You think you beat me because you work for Julian Kane? You think you can double-cross me in Chicago and get away with it? What's he talking about, Shark? Who cares? Take him down. That's 200 bucks. That's 100 apiece. How come I gotta split it with you? Uh, Charlie's grip is too weak. Uh, uh, uh. You got some technique, eh? Abby trained you to be a hooker. A hooker? Like a prostitute? <laughs> yeah, Buzz. You're a hooker. $200 a night hooker. <laughs> Sir, can I go back to sleep now? Uh, you want to go to sleep, eh? That can be arranged. Charlie squirms around and hops on his back and tries to put a sleeper on Buzzsaw whose neck is like a tire. Sir, if you just uh, don't... Buzz turns around quickly and tries to move Charlie to the side, but Charlie flips completely over to the floor and bangs his head on the seat. Oh shit, Mr. Gotch, I'm so sorry. Nice going, you dumb fuck. He just broke Charlie Gotch's neck. You told me to. Veteran ring announcer and Charlie's right-hand man, Freddy Fingler, walks up. What the fuck, guys? We're trying to get some sleep. Oh shit, Charlie, what are you doing here? I thought it was the boys horsing around. He picks up Charlie off the floor. Charlie, you're bleeding. Eh, just a little cut No big deal. Nice one, butt face. Eh, you just got us fight. Eh, Made me fight eh, you. I didn't even want eh, you. Nice one, Buzz Whip. You did better than I thought. Eh, eh. King of the Ring, I'll be back after these messages. Just for the fun of it. of millions. The nicest things still happen between just two people. Oh, champ! Oh, <laughs> and when you brush your breath with dentine, being together is nicer for everyone. You're really here. Because not even mouthwash can freshen your breath better than when you're chewing lively, long-lasting dentine. With the whole wide world for you, now it's down to just Brush your breath with now return to Kings of the Ring. All 
Hercules Harris walks in the locker room late. Late because these days he never goes until the second half of the show. He's being built up to work Thor Hansen at Empire Mania, so it's no more opening matches for him. As he looks around for a spot in the dressing room, he smiles as he spots Leroy Brown back in the Empire, sweaty from his match, but huge gut hanging over his trunks, limping badly, and goes to sit down, heavily panting and breathing. He goes to check on him when, who did he do? Hercules' smile immediately disappears hearing that name and that voice as he sees Deshaun Brown, satin jacket on, carrying his suitcase, hand held out to shake. Looks like it's time for me to fly. What you talking about, Deshaun? Hendo just fired me. Say what? Should've seen this coming. How? Well, Leroy. He's back now, so they don't need me anymore. They already got one. You know how it is. Shit, blood, you probably next. They was looking for you. You coming in all late is just the excuse they need to fire your black ass. But you and I know the real reason. Hey, maybe we could tag team. Sell ourselves to Ironside or one of them outlaws down in Alabama. Deshaun Brown and Kunta Kinte. <laughs> Guess what? It was me, motherfucker. I'm the one who got you fired. What? I ain't no fucking Kunta Kinte. I ain't no fucking slave. I ain't no curtain jerker. I'm the head motherfucker for the number one territory in the business. I'm headlining Empire Mania 2 against Thor Hansen in the biggest show in the world. And I told Julian Kane to fire you, and he did it. Just like that. Why? It's been a long ass time since you trained me, Deshaun, and I ain't your boy anymore. I done sold out arenas all over the Carolinas, and now I'm a top guy for the Empire Wrestling Federation. I'd never team with you, because you ain't nothing in this business. You hear me? You ain't nothing. Deshaun looks back at Hercules, eyes watering, but not saying a thing. Okay, Hercules. I'll see you down the road. Deshaun Brown walks away silently as Hercules grits his teeth in frustration. He picks up his oversized duffel bag and looks across the locker room and spots his sweaty tummy Aloha back from his match and drops his bag next to him and pats his championship friend on the back as he looks in the mirror against the wall and immediately looks away. What was once way out west of Hudson Street is now site of the dramatically expanding section of Greenwich Village in New York City. The old red brick building slowly replaced by high-rises along the river where EWF superstar Michael Angel now lives. Between the punks, bohemians, musicians, and artists of the village, there are no other wrestlers or wrestling fans here, allowing Angel to blend in as part of the eclectic tapestry of the village, unbothered and free to act on his impulses, like his visits to the piers along the west bank of the Hudson River, the unmentionable part of town where Michael frequently picks up his house guests for the night. Uh, why the fuck are you still here? In his loft apartment, Michael sees a young man in his kitchen, in jean shorts cut off right below his ass cheeks, and socks pulled up his shins with blue horizontal stripes. Good morning to you too, baby. Listen, we need to talk about last night. You took the rubber off. Yeah, I don't like wearing them. Not like I can get you pregnant or something. No, but it's the 80s. We should still be practicing safe sex. Safe? I didn't get rough at you at all. Michael stands, his muscular body starting to soften up in the middle. Anyway, someone named Gabe called while you were sleeping. He sounds like a hunk. Is he you talk to Gabriel on the phone? No. Answering machine, honey. Michael doesn't even know how to react. You know, there's this party tonight in Grove Street. You want to go with me? No, fuck no. 
I ain't going out in public with you. You should just get your shit and leave. My goodness, aren't you a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? <laughs> Luckily, you're so damn cute. See you around, cowboy. Michael stares at the answering machine, reminded of his brother, reminded of his family, and what he left behind. Then reaches over to a small scattering of colored pills in the nightstand and swallows them. sits on a paper-lined seat where he seemingly spent half his life these days, the Charlotte Hospital, meeting with his doctor. His look continues to change, his body getting out of shape, his trademark bleach blonde locks barely able to cover the dark roots growing from underneath like weeds, his clean trademark jaw starting to get covered by a dark beard stubble. The doctor points at the x-ray film on the light box on the wall. I have good news and bad news, Donnie. The fractures in your spine have healed 100%. The bone has responded tremendously to the treatment and medicines. It's, it's quite impressive. Then why can't I walk or move my legs at all? I can't say. The surrounding tissue is almost completely healed. Yet the nerve endings are still unresponsive. Deck, I'm a wrestler. What am I supposed to do? Donnie, I'm not a wrestling fan, but even I know who you are. You told me you're a millionaire and with no family. You must have a fortune saved. With the right investments, you can make that last a lifetime. Donnie just looks down in sorrow. Just keep up with the supplements and manually moving your legs at the clinic, and we'll check your progress in a month. A month? <laughs> I don't even know if I'll be here in a month. Where are you going? Uh, I wouldn't recommend any long-distance travel at this time. Don't worry. I won't be going anywhere. What was that, Donnie? Nothing. It's 1964 in Jersey City at the Kane household. 13-year-old Julian Kane is doing his arithmetic at the kitchen table, while Father Jonathan Kane is going over house show figures for the month, both with pencils and notebooks. Oh, look at my two men. So hard at work. Like father, like son. Julian looks to his father for a reaction until someone walks in. Jenny, my boy, you in here? The near 50-year-old Charlie Gotch bursts into the kitchen Accompanied by a recent high school graduate, Sal Spinelli. Hey boss, I've been working on my Dominic Dante pose. The 20 year old clutches his hands together and sucks in his stomach and puffs out his chest from the side. Think I'm ready to start wrestling yet? Not quite, Sal, but Dominic will let me know when you're ready. In the meantime, lay off the brujoule, or that belly of yours is gonna burst. Gloria, give me a sweetheart. He leans in and gives a friendly kiss on the mouth. She awkwardly looks around, forcing a smile, as Julian watches everything. He sees she won't even look him in the eye. Oh, my! Hi, Charlie, come in. Can I get you a drink? Double ship us on the rocks? You get it. Sal walks over to the bottles and waves her off. I got it, Gloria. I'll take care of the old men. Thanks, Sal. Julian, say hello to Charlie Gotch. He's here from AMW in Milwaukee. I remember him. The last time he was here. Surprised he can even see me through that map in his head. Oh, uh, he's trying to be like that new musical group from the Ed Sullivan show. The Mosquitoes. Uh, no, uh, the Beatles. The Beatles. I'm sure everyone will forget you there in a couple years. Just a fad. That's it. Julian, uh, why don't you take your homework into the living room? Jonathan's son gathers his things. How's business in the Midwest, Charlie? How's it going with the new kid, uh... Billy Melrose? Betty Melrose. Hollywood Betty Melrose. I think I can really make money with this kid. Uh, he's got a great future. Respects the business uh, and a pretty good shooter, too. Still think you put too much on these shooters. Hey boy, Julian Kane so stands in the doorway, hands. staring. No, glaring at Charlie Gotch. Sal Spinelli grabs the 13-year-old Julian by the arm and squeezes it with a vice grip. I believe the old man said to take your homework into the living room and pushes him out the door. Sal looks back to make sure the door is shut, then punches young Julian Kane in the stomach. <laughs> After Sal goes back in the kitchen, Julian sits down on the brown sofa in front of the TV, clutching his stomach in pain. And the door swings open again, and his mother walks out. How can you do it? She walks to the coffee table and picks up coasters. Act like 
Everything's normal. She walks to the door. I know what he did. She freezes in her tracks and fumbles the coasters in her hand. I don't know what you're talking about. When I was eight years old, last time he was in our house, he took off his pants. Julian, whatever you think happened didn't. You're just an imaginative little boy. Boy, I'm about to be a man. You don't know anything about the world. Just drop it. I know what he did. I was... Enough, Julian. I don't want to hear another word. And you'll say nothing of these figments of your imagination to your father or anyone. I mean it. Swear to me, Julian. How can you just pretend like nothing ever... Swear it, Julian. Okay. I swear. He walks over and turns on the TV. Here. Empire State Wrestling is on. Why don't you watch what puts the roof over our heads for once? Maybe you'll finally start to like it. She pushes through the door as he looks at the television. The pain in his stomach from Sal's punch. Only drowned out by the pain of what's happening with his parents. When he sees something on the screen he's never seen before. A young man steps into the ring. Tall enough to step over the top rope? This man is different from anyone he's ever seen in his life. The 13-year-old Julian is completely entranced as he watches the seven-foot Goliath, and he sees what pro wrestling can be. And for the first time in too long, the pain of the world just fades away. Julian Kane stands in his den listening to Beethoven on his new tape deck in his swanky Manhattan apartment, his son Cameron Kane doing his arithmetic at the kitchen table, while Sarah prepares dinner. He takes another swig from his Chivas Regal drink while staring at an old picture of his mother and father. When Sarah shouts from the kitchen, Julian's here! He rolls his eyes impatiently and walks into the kitchen. Julian, it's here! What is it? On the table! He looks at the kitchen table and sees a gold foil envelope wrapped in a red velvet ribbon. He stops as his eyes flicker. She nods her head as he looks at her. This is it, isn't it? He opens the envelope and sees the parchment paper inside. What he's been waiting seemingly his entire life for. The official invitation from the Sam Worthington Social Society. Yes, Stuart Flaherty and Matthew Rogers came through. I'm in. The next party is soon, Sarah. Tomorrow, you're getting a new dress. You don't have to tell me twice. Julian sets it down carefully like he was handling the actual Declaration of Independence. He looks off to the side, with a tear in his eye. Finally, vindication. This is it, Sarah. I have arrived. My father could only dream of being in the Hollingsworth Society. And now, I'm in. She kisses and hugs him. Yes. And to commemorate this occasion, my arrival in the elite of New York City, I've just made an incredible decision. I am going to put Empire Mania in Milwaukee. You're gonna put your biggest show of the year in Milwaukee? Granted, the Mecca Arena will only hold around 12,000 people, but it's not about that. It's the headquarter city of American Midwest Wrestling and Charlie Gotcha's hometown. This Charlie again. What is your problem with this man? I wouldn't even know where to begin. Thanks so much to RJ City, Evan Ginsberg, and Cyrus Fees, and many others for their contributions to the show the Mana Sports Media production team, and of course, you the listener, for enjoying Kings of the Ring and continuing to spread the word about the show all over the world. 